there was always a couple of guys on the reservation that made canoes, maybe two or three different families made canoes. Everybody didn't make canoes because of the simple reason they didn't know how. And the other people, if they wanted a canoe, they would go and order one from uh, whoever knew how to make them. Yeah, bring, keep bringing it down right here. Years ago, we were involved with um, the Paddle to Seattle in 1989, and at that time we had Marvin Star Sr.'s father carve a canoe for us. And then all these years I've been asking Marvin Star Sr. to carve another canoe for us for the last four or five years, and, and he would say, oh yeah, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Well, when he retired from the fisheries department, he's now 80 years old, he says, now I'm ready to carve your canoe. Uh, right now I'm working on a canoe for the tribe. It's uh, 28 feet long, red cedar canoe. You think about it all the time. After you start working on it, so I walk out of the house and go and look at it, see if it's all right. When you got the tree there, you figure out how long you're gonna make that canoe and you look at the end, cut so much off and get rid of that hollow and get some sound wood. You cut it into blocks, 25 inch blocks, and you cut them all the way down until you got half a log. Get that bark off, shape it out with hand tools, and dig it out, hollow it out. I have respect for cedar, any kind of cedar. It's what the Indians used from way back in time. That's, that's what everything's made out of and cedar floats, floats better than other wood, and it don't soak up the water like a, like a fir tree would. When they made them canoes the old way, they burned the outside. It kind of weatherproofs that cedar. Guys always come over there and say, what color are you gonna paint it? And you're not gonna paint it. We don't paint canoes. We absolutely treat our canoes as living beings and it comes from those cedar trees that provided for our people historically most of the tools that we needed to survive our clothing the things that we ate with the things that we hunted with all of those things came from that cedar tree so we absolutely treat them with that type of respect and how we care for them how we talk to them um, how we engage in our spiritual practices in them Canoes have always been an integral part of the tribe because we have the rivers, we have the sound, you know, we, we use that for fishing, we use that for, for traveling along the waterways. It's something that we don't want to lose. We want our, our children to know what the canoe means to us and we want them to be able to, to do it themselves in the future. There was communities all around this area. It was the white man that went and put us on a reservation in a little small area and wanted us to stay there. They put us on this three or four blocks that they made into a reservation. Now, before that, people lived all around here on each side of the river. Along the waterways was, was where you could survive best. You know, when they took fishing away from our people, you, you really emasculated a whole generation of men. And before that, when they put us on this reservation, right, then people couldn't provide for themselves. You created a welfare state. Then they weren't allowed to speak our language or practice our culture, and they burned our longhouses down. They burned our canoes. That's why they're not here. It wasn't because we lost them or they just floated away some days. They were burned by missionaries. We see that our culture has never been dead, but it's a revitalization process that we're we're spearheading now. In a couple generations, we've gone from over 90% unemployment and most people living in you know, abject poverty, um, very little language or cultural expressions. And so in a couple generations, we've eradicated much of that. with the re-establishment of our rights to, to fish and hunt in our usual custom areas then provided us the basis to create some economic endeavors that have paid off for us. The majority of that money goes into education, goes into housing, and goes into health care. Going on 
on a river rock this would, would just take anything off. I really have to commend our Muckleshoot Indian tribe. Education is the number one priority of the Tribal Council and the community here at Muckleshoot. And it's not just talking the talk, it's walking the walk. Because it's important to point out that the leadership here at Muckleshoot has put a predominant share of the revenues into education. Um, it's just one of those things that I think all of the horizons in terms of educational perspectives have been enhanced here in the Muckleshoot community and it's absolutely exciting. It's extraordinary. My dad was a chief. He, he was the last chief of this tribe. You had to learn how to talk to your people, how to treat them, how to teach them. He was learning that, and then they took him off to a government school, so he lost that training. Mostly I just learned from watching. What he was doing is what I'm doing. These guys are supposed to know how to make a canoe when I'm done teaching them. Learning from your own dad is probably harder than anything else because he wants you to learn it right. Everything that we were told to do and where to cut and how far to cut and how much to cut was told to us by my father and everything that he told us turned out true and straight. It was amazing how he could just look at the wood and tell us where to cut it, how much to cut it, and what to use and when, and it all turned out right every time. Well, when I first started carving nets, I wanted to do something for the tribe. Yeah, me, yeah, I love this. I know it makes you more humble carving something like this. That's for sure. Brings you closer to your roots. Someone like Tyson, who traveled with us on canoe journey and then went a different route for quite a few years. And as he admittedly said, struggled and got in trouble and has been in jail, and drugs and alcohol and so forth. Carving has brought him peace and helping him stay clean and sober and, and to become a man now and to reconnect him with something that he already knew. Carving and art brought me back to reality, I guess. That's what keeps me uh, grounded. When I see a young man like Tyson and I see his focus and his passion, and I see the, the patience and the guidance and the love and the commitment that Marvin Sr. has for Tyson in terms of passing on his craft and what Marvin Sr. has done for his son, Marvin Jr. That's the vision of the creator. What I've told Cub and I've told our canoe family is that when we finish this canoe, we're not gonna hang it in a building. We're not gonna just put it on display. We're going to use the canoe. They'll use it on their canoe journey. They'll use it for their youth. They'll teach the youth how to respect the canoe and how it can teach them different aspects of our life. We're going to do a second canoe. Cub wants to go ahead and select the tree this time, and he doesn't plan to work on the next canoe. He's going to supervise. He'll have Marvin Jr. and Tyson work on the canoe themselves and do all the work. And so then they can learn and pass it on to, to others. I feel connected to the canoe, to the culture. It all hits you right when you start working on it. You could feel it.
It is a spiritual thing. Might sing me a song for that canoe. That's the old way.